First, please welcome Professor John Eastman. Thanks, John. You didn't tell me the reason you accepted my call was that I'm closer in age to Ben Franklin than I am to Mary Catherine Ham. <laughs> I've been asked to talk about how the Tea Party reflects the principles of the founding, and I want to do this by making fun of President Barack Obama. <laughs> I know none of you want to hear that in this room. You remember six months ago, his first State of the Union address. He made that little gaffe. It wasn't really a gaffe. He's looking into his teleprompter, and he quotes our Constitution's proposition that all men are created equal. Our Constitution, he said. Remember, looking into the teleprompter. Let me see if I get this right. <laughs> our Constitution doesn't say anything of the kind. Of course, that proposition is in our Declaration of Independence. And the fact that it was on his teleprompter means he'd edited it. This constitutional law scholar from, I'm ashamed to say, my alma mater, the University of Chicago. That means his staff vetted it. His speech writers wrote it. The biggest speech writing shop the world has ever known didn't understand the difference between our Constitution and our Declaration of Independence. When I was running for Attorney General in California, I had a lot of fun with that. Every stop. But about halfway through the campaign, I started realizing I should quit having fun with it because he probably didn't make a gaffe. I started thinking about what it was he was trying to accomplish. You see, our Declaration of Independence has that as a basic premise from which governments that are legitimate flow. Because we are all created equal, we can't rule each other's without consent. Because we have rights from our creator, inalienable rights, God given to us, we have them because of God, not because of government, that the purpose of government is to secure those rights. And the only legitimate purpose of government is to do that. And when it ceases to do that, we have certain rights and duties as a people to change that government. See, that's the basic premise. And within the Declaration of Independence, it's very clear. By putting it as a proposition over into the Constitution, what is our Constitution? It's our goals of government. It's no longer the foundational premises for the legitimacy of government. It's the purpose and outcome of government. We're going to egalitarianize the whole society. If you work and make money and you don't, we're going to take from you and give to you. See, and you see the whole seed of health care and everything else that's going on in government by that little shift from our declaration to our constitution that he tried to pull there. Well, it's not happening. He and the whole century of elite opinion in this country, and you have to recognize Barack Obama is the culmination of a century of progressive thought in this country. They need to read a little further into that declaration of independence as well. You see, since the New Deal, We've been overtaxed and overregulated, and because we haven't revolted yet, that elite in government have assumed we've accepted it. We've even enjoyed it. They need to read a little further into that second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. It says we won't change our governments for light and transient reasons. It says we'll suffer abuses and evils while they remain sufferable. But the next line is the one they need to pay particular attention to. But at some point, those abuses become insufferable. And at that point, it's not only the right, but it is the duty of the people to rise up and alter or abolish their governments, to get them back on track to doing what they're supposed to do. <clears throat> That's not a new idea. It's as old as 1776. And it is reflected in the Tea Party movement today. You've heard about it all weekend. Uh, from Virginia and New Jersey, I, I had a great opportunity to spend a lot of time with um, Michelle uh, uh, Bachman over the course of my campaign. She spent a lot of time in California, I think raising money there. Um, uh, and, and she had this wonderful line. She said, we even elected Governor Christie in New Jersey where there are no longer any Republicans. Uh, uh, and in Massachusetts. And there's a tidal wave that began there. And it's a tidal wave reflected in the Tea Party movement, but it's a tidal wave of people that have crossed over that Rubicon threshold that the Declaration of Independence sets out. From evils that are sufferable to evils that have become insufferable. And it's the people that have made that transition that are forming the basis of the Tea Party movement. And so I thought I would go back to the other parts of the Declaration of Independence that we don't spend much time focusing on. Because after that wonderful uh, entry and then wonderful statement of premises and that statement of cause and purpose, it gets into the litany of charges against the King of England. How many of these resonate? 
I thought I would just go through a couple and maybe put my own twist on them. He has refused his assent to law as the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. The Democrats in Congress, beholden to trial lawyers and public employee unions, have refused to adopt basic tort and pension reform laws, that which would be the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has called together legislative bodies in unusual places. He has forbidden to his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasions of the rights of the people. How about a couple of these? The Congress, together with the President, has spent trillions of dollars without constitutional authority, showering their political cronies with financial rewards at taxpayers' expense. He has sought to prevent assemblies of citizens and restricted their political speech. Here's the declaration. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states for the purpose uh, for, the per for that purpose, obstructing the laws for naturalization for foreigners. Here then we were trying to uh, attract additional population. Now we're trying to stem the flow. He has endeavored to prevent enforcement of our borders, not only refusing to enforce existing immigration laws, but seeking to prevent the states from enforcing immigration laws on their own. Here's the declaration, the king has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing to assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. Here's the current. He has obstructed the administration of justice by filling the courts with judges committed to empathy rather than the rule of law. <clears throat> Here's the declaration. The king has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out our substance. Here's the current. He has erected a multitude of new officers and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and to eat out our substance. Here's the declaration. He has kept among us in times of peace standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. Here's the modern twist. He has interfered with the efficient operation of a military in order to pursue a pro-homosexual political agenda. Here's the declaration. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our Constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent, assent to their acts of pretended legislation. Here's the modern version. He has combined with the United Nations and other international bodies to subject us to an international law, ignoring the limits of our own Constitution. For quartering large bodies of armed troops among us and for protecting them by mock trial from punishment. Here's the modern version. He has encouraged voter fraud, ACORN, and outright voter intimidation, the new Black Panthers, in order to solidify his political power and protect his agents from prosecution for their illegal actions. Here's the king. For cutting off our trade with all parts of a world. The modern version. They have imposed excessive regulations on business that have undermined our trade with the rest of the world. Here's the old version, for taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our government. They have imposed taxes on us beyond the authority conferred by our Constitution. The old version, for suspending our legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. The new version, their federal courts have taken upon themselves to legislate. Invalidating, invalidating valid laws is contrary to made-up constitutional provisions and affirming unconstitutional laws. He is old version. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. Arizona, take heed. He has abdicated government here but allowing our border states to be invaded without recourse. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. Modern version, they have claimed vast tracts of state land as their own. The old version, he has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages whose only known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. Modern version, he's embracing Sharia law. He's excited domestic insurrections and boycotts against the people of a sovereign state for merely attempting to secure their own borders. I go through that litany with that detail because I think it more becomes manifestly clear 
that not just those of us in the Tea Party, but every one of us in this country needs to understand we have crossed that Rubicon from evils that remain sufferable to those that are no longer sufferable. You're going to hear from a wonderful panel. <clears throat> You're going to hear from a wonderful panel about how that is being put into place on the ground, but I want to tell you in closing, I was a candidate for attorney general in the most populous state in the nation. I used to say the largest, but my brother in Texas says we're larger than you. And then Sarah Palin said up in Alaska, Texas, you better be careful. We'll split in two, and then you'll be the third largest. <laughs> uh, as an attorney general candidate, I started from scratch in a law professor's position. No, no name ID other than what the Hugh Hewitt show provided me, which I have to confess is a lot. Um, and in four months, we ran a campaign that got over 34% of the vote statewide in a three-way race. And it was because of the Tea Party and its enthusiasm and its Facebooks and its networks and its Twitter. <laughs> Twitter. I had somebody Twittering for me. I didn't know they could even do that. People thought I knew how to Twitter. Um, but it's because of that social networking and the Tea Party, people who used to be soccer moms or national security moms or all of those things um, who would give up time from their day on a Sunday afternoon to show up in a lo local high school gym for some unknown candidate from the southern part of the state, 700 people strong. Everywhere in the state that happened. And if it can happen in California, it can happen in Colorado, it can happen in Nebraska, it can happen in Arkansas, it can happen in every state of this country come November, and it's these people that are going to make it happen, and all of you. Thank you. John Eastman, you let someone Twitter for you? Are you the Milli Vanilli of new media? <laughs> I must say. I do my own Facebook, though. I do how to do that. <laughs> We're going to hear now from Michelle Morin, William Owens, Charles Patrickoff, in the order that you see them, seated up here. We'll ask each to give us a snapshot of what this Tea Party movement is all about and why they are involved and why it matters to all of us in a decisive year of 2010. And as each is able to be concise, there will be an opportunity for crosstalk among the four panelists and some contributions from all of you. First, Michelle Morin, Coalition for a Constitutional or a Conservative, synonymous, Coalition for a Conservative Majority. Michelle. Thank you, John. It is great to be here. I love being in a room with friends who love freedom. And, you know, the battle for freedom in America really started here. And there was that old nasty gang of four who decided to turn our state blue, and they did quite a job of it. And an avalanche has started, and it's starting here, and it's going to wipe out that liberal agenda. And I'm, I'm sure you all are going to join me in, uh, in that mission and helping to wipe out their agenda. Um, <laughs> As John mentioned, I'm with CCM, and in our name is the, the word coalition. And what we have tried to do over the last year or so is network the different grassroots group leaders across the state, different conservative activists, and conservative lawmakers into just a, a simple communications forum. We've dubbed it Operation Avalanche. It's an online Google group using technology where um, over 100 of us communicate daily. Topics range um, from social issues to national security issues to very, very local issues. And um, the vision is that the alliances that we've been talking about can be formed uh, from across the state. And it's interesting what we've been learning. Um, one of the things we've learned with conservatives is, it, in contrast to how the left was able to organize and unite around the issues they cared about, Conservatives are very independent. We're wired the way God made us. We think independently. We are intelligent. And uh, generally speaking, we don't need someone telling us what to do. And those on the left do like the status top-down model that the, the move-ons uh, provide for them, the moveon.org. But as of yet, we really haven't seen that develop for conservatives. So we're relying on the networking across our state 
to uh, make this happen. And many people in this room are in the network. I can see probably a dozen just looking out right now, and I'm sure there will be more. But we are in the fishbowl state, and what's, what's happening here really could set the trend for what goes on across the rest of the nation. So we are excited about what's going to happen in Colorado. And um, I just want to divert a little bit. I tend to reject the term tea party. Uh, I just had someone out in the hallway say, which tea party do you belong to? <laughs> and I said, I, I, I don't belong to a tea party. Um, I like to call this a, a freedom revival. This is a, a, a response to the progressive choke on freedom that started about 100 years ago and intensified in the last 10 and then seriously intensified in the last few. And groups started popping up all over the place back in um, 2009. Uh, I think probably the tax day of 2009 was the huge kickoff for this movement. But um, anytime we succumb to a label, we uh, make ourselves vulnerable to the media stereotypes and uh, the ranters, the, uh, the Nazi-ish, and um, they're, they're looking for a center of gravity that they can take out. And the funny thing is, there's no leader for this movement. There's no centralized organization, which is a beautiful thing, because really what the left is trying to take out is truth, founding principles, and our Constitution. And that's what we the people are trying to protect. As I meet leaders across the state, there are some incredible people who have risen to meet the need uh, to fight for freedom. And um, there are many who are outspoken, many in this room, and they're wonderful. But you know, I've also met so many of what I call the silent foot soldiers. Uh, I guess the silent majority would be a good way to put it. Uh, I've conducted some, uh, I, I developed a workshop called Political Power Tools that I conducted uh, once a month. And I would basically try to just bring in anybody who felt the choke of freedom and teach them how to get active using the free online tools available, like John mentioned, Twitter, Facebook. Those are very effective. I know Michelle Malkin mentioned that was her, um, that was her ticket to get out of the Beltway and get here because she was still be able to be who she was, but remotely. So uh, the, the interesting thing about our experience is these silent foot soldiers, they come to meetings, they come to workshops, they sign up to, to do things and, and take action, and they do it. And they don't seek glory. They don't even, even seek leadership. They just love this country, and they're out there doing the work. An example is um, www.savehealthcarechoice.org. We're trying to recruit as many circulators as we can to uh, get the uh, Colorado Right to Healthcare Choice initiative on the November ballot. And it is such a passionate topic that people do not like Obamacare, they're resisting it. We get people, I get people calling me almost every day saying, I've got three completed petitions, can I bring them to your house and pick up more empty ones? And they come to my house, I talk to them. These are the people who are making this happen. They're on their knees in prayer, they're walking the walk, they're talking the talk, they're out there getting it done. And I know it's happening all across the state. So it's an amazing movement that's going on and it's really going to depend on all of you and people you know, and I have faith that it's going to happen. So, um, that's Michelle, if how do we find you online? Those who would like to join your coalition and network with you, give us an address. Uh, if you want to join, um, there's several different ones. If you want to join the coalition in Colorado Springs, if you're if you're near the, the Pikes Peak region, it's ccm-cos.com. If you're interested in joining Operation Avalanche, uh, which is the online uh, discussion forum for activists across the state, email uh, me directly at momforfreedom at earthlink.net, and that's fine, I'll take your emails, and that's mom, the number for freedom. And if you want to circulate petitions to get the healthcare ballot initiative on the uh, ballot in November, go to the website um, savehealthcarechoice.org, and you can contact us directly there. So. Michelle Moran, thank you so much. <laughs> William Owens, Tea Party Express, tell us about it. Hello, Denver! That's how we do it. That's how we do it with the Tea Party Express. 
because it is a party. How many have been to an actual tea party? Raise your hand. Awesome. Fantastic. For those who, how many have been to a tea party express event? Fantastic. Well, I have a treat for those who haven't. Let me know when y'all have it queued up. Um, first of all, thank you all for having me here to be here and to celebrate all of what you're doing. Hasn't this information been all inspiring It really has. Okay, we are ready. Let's go to a tea party right now. Watch the screens. So good to be kind of retracing the steps of the American liberty and doing our part to go ahead and help take back this country um, and put it back on track. The Tea Party Express has been the spearhead of a movement that has no organization, as we all know, but they needed a voice, and the Tea Party Express is that voice. and go to work, get out into the streets, get out into the polling places, and, and changing America, and we're going to do it. Well, look out Washington, D.C., because we are on a roll. And we're rocking across this country with a message to be told. The people, they are standing up all across this land. And they're sending you a message that we hope you understand. With a Tea Party Express, and we're rocking through. Things it's important for people to realize that the first line of government is not federal. The first line of government is your family, and that's what it's about. And then you got the second line of government, and that is our church, our, our, our schools. It's so many lines of government prior to the federal government. The Tea Party movement got them running scared. They know that their lives cannot penetrate the truth. It's 2010. We gon' prove it at the truth. We don't care if you're a deep. We don't care if you're a no. If your clothes don't stand, put the stripes in the stall. Let liberty prevail to this. I dedicate my life. I'm standing up for freedom for my babies and my wife. I'm voting for the best candidate now. I've always just voted straight Democrat. I've always done it. I was taught that. I lived by that. But when you learn about it, you start to do it. This is our last big day in Washington, D.C. We have had a victorious march across this country. We have motivated fellow patriots to continue their fight. We are an army of citizens, and we will take this country back. God bless you all for supporting TeaPartyExpress.tv, and we'll see you on the next tour as we come across America. God bless America. That's my commercials. Thank you, Mr. Andrews. Did y'all enjoy that? I, I went to bed at four this morning to put that together for you guys. I enjoyed doing it. Let me just talk to you all about the Tea Party. And, and, and with respect to many of you knowing about the Tea Party and where it is, where it's been, and how it was conceived, I, I somewhat want to talk about where it's going. Um, what is the agenda now? Um, we also understand that many people make assumptions about the social aspect of the Tea Party community. Um, I often say when I speak, on the Tea Party Express that this is not about pigmentation, it's about principles. It's not about color, it's about character. <laughs> Where are we headed socially? You know, we talk about our amendments, the rights we have, the freedom of speech, and I would argue that those on the right are not using their freedom of speech to the fullest. And if we don't use it, we will allow the left, uh, the idiotic individuals who are endorsed by our own government to make racial slurs and claims even to the extent about killing people. I'm sure you all have seen this recent atrocity happening. I would never think I would see such a thing on American airwaves and allow the government to condone it. If we don't use our freedom of speech, it will socially and culturally be redefined. 
And I'm reminded of a parable that my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ gave when he had an opportunity to witness to several people. The first one was a woman at the well, and she had the audacity to play the race card on Jesus. She said, I'm a Samaritan. What dealings do the Jews have with us? And then again, when he was brought before Pilate, and Pilate said, am I a Jew? How many times are we put in positions and situations to where we automatically say, well, I can't say that to this person. Well, so I'm not hijacked when I leave this table and pull to the side in a hall somewhere and someone asks me, well, tell me, you know, what is it like from a black perspective? <laughs> because that's what usually happens. Um, it's our responsibility to talk principle to anyone who can hear and understand. We cannot define who we talk to when it comes to truth. We simply talk the truth. And to those who have ears, guess what? They're going to hear it. And to those who don't, it doesn't matter what color they are. They're not going to hear it anyway. So moving forward with the Tea Party movement, I am so enthused. I am so excited about all Americans. Um, one of the most exciting places for me to go to actually is the barbershop. It's fun. It's a wonder I leave with all my hair. Uh, the barbershop is a place for, for black America where discussions are held, people talk about things, um, and it's just a real conversation. And you will be amazed. Uh, the principles that Tea Partiers share are shared by a whole lot of people in different cultures and different communities. Let's not assume that people don't celebrate them because they don't come to our party. Sometimes they're having their own parties in different places, but you'll find that we have a lot of things in common. So socially and culturally, we have an opportunity as conservatives to, def to define what the Tea Party will become. Let's not allow the left to capture that and take it hostage. And we will do that if we remain silent. We will do that if we let them look us in our face and say, am I black? Am I white? Just remember what our Lord and Savior Jesus did. He kept talking. And so will I, and I encourage you to do the same. Um, the Tea Party Express is launching its next tour, October um, 1st through November 1st. It'll be our boldest yet. We'll be doing about 70 stops from around the country, starting in Florida and concluding in Washington, um, Seattle, Washington. And we're real excited. In fact, if you want to get an essence of the Tea Party movement, we have these journals available, and it has a CD inside um, of the Tea Party song that you were hearing. Your support is appreciated for this, just like everybody's been talking. I'm a capitalist, too. <laughs> in 2008, I wrote a book called Obama, Why Black America Should Have Doubts. And it just takes a look at his ideology and compares it with our traditional values as all Americans. But I did target specifically this. Dr. Alveda King is the niece to Dr. Martin Luther King. And she wrote the foreword to the book. And um, I also wrote a Christian book, Warriors Arise, because at the end of the day, we are engaged in a spiritual warfare. So I want to thank you all once again for having me to be a part of this. And you can still corner me if you want to get some more questions answered. God bless you. I got that William Owens message several weeks ago, and I thought, oh, our former governor wants to come to the summit. But the message included a web address. I took a look at the web, um, and I realized, no, he was a good governor, but he didn't hang out with rappers. So I knew it was a different guy. <laughs> yeah, speaking of rappers, politic, this is his CD. And if you all want to follow the tour online, go to teapartyexpress.tv. You can actually follow the tour, the tour live and see a lot of videos that we have up there right now. How about the name Hear Us Now? That kind of gets your attention. Charles Patrikoff, tell us about Hear Us Now. Thank you, John. I'm glad to be here. Uh, thanks for inviting us. And um, this is an opportunity for just another voice. Uh, Hear Us Now is just another one of the many Tea Party or 912 groups that have uh, risen in the uh, Denver metro area. Um, we try to stay cl closely affiliated with all the various groups as best we can, either through our internet connections and our website is hearus-now.org. 
Again, that's hearus-now.org. If you don't put the dash in, you won't find us. Um, one of the things that uh, we wanted to do was just get people together and st start the rallies. We, st we got the first uh, Tea Party permit for the uh, state capitol on uh, April 15th, 2009. And depending on who you talk to, it could be as many as 8,000, maybe more folks just showed up. Um, and it was amazing. Um, last year, we about the same. Uh, it's getting more and more difficult to get permits. You wonder why. Um, <clears throat> uh, one of our good friends, Jason Worley, is with the 912 uh, Broomfield Project, and I believe he's been passing out one of the next flyers, or the next rallies that's coming up. Couldn't get the, the uh, permit for 912, so it's going to be on September 13th. Oh, well. We can adjust. Uh, we're, we can be flexible. My whole reason for getting involved in uh, the Tea Party, and that was, I believe, one of your questions, was how did this thing get going? How, how did I get involved? Uh, just a quick show of hands. How many of you folks here today took the oath to preserve and protect the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, both foreign and domestic, so help you God? Take a look around the room, folks. Look how many hands. <clears throat> For me, I was sitting on my couch in my family room, yelling at the TV, um, like maybe some of you have. <clears throat> and I imagined myself standing before the supreme judge of the universe at his bar of judgment. And he asked me this question. How'd you like sitting on that couch I gave you? I didn't have a very good answer for that. And then the next question is, what are you going to do? Well, I was pretty convinced sitting on the couch and yelling at the TV set probably wasn't the right course of action. Uh, later that night, I got on the internet and uh, came across your website, came across several other websites, and I put my name in as a volunteer. That's all I did. Next thing I knew, I was getting phone calls, emails. I didn't know what to do with all of this. Well, fortunately, you all did. You showed up. All I did was leave my phone number and leave my email address The folks did the rest. We are just folks that are concerned. We are very concerned about the future of our country. We're very concerned for the future of our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. We've all heard it. We've all heard the threats. We've had some great speakers. My sin was complacency. I sat on the couch and did nothing. I had to repent, and that is my word. I think we need to take it into consideration. I had to repent, I got up off the couch, and I stood up. Will you stand for the Constitution for the United States of America? Will you stand? God bless America! Woo! Charles Patrickoff, William Owens, Michelle Moran, John Eastman, thank you all. We have a few moments for your questions, friends, but I want to do a lightning round with the panel as your questions are being prepared. Panelists, uh, just a, a, a one word, one phrase answer uh, coming this way from Charles First question, the people that you encounter in your slice of this movement, are they new get-off-the-couch first-timers like yourself, Charles, or are a lot of them folks who have already been politically active and they're just doing it under a, under a new banner? Which would you say it is, Charles? 
I haven't done a statistical analysis, John, I'll be honest, but based on the phone calls I've received, the emails that I've received, I would say a true majority are folks that have had enough, they've never gotten involved before, and now they're showing up. When we did the uh, July 4th uh, Independence Day rally, uh, 2009, we simply asked for folks to provide hot dogs and hot dog buns, maybe bring some chips, you know, to help defray the cost of feeding everybody. We had more food than we had any idea what to do with. We ended up giving it to, uh, to the uh, homeless shelters and, and, and those sort of things. It was wonderful. So, again, it's just folks. That's, it, that's great. In other words, it's not just politics. Now it's turning into loaves and fishes, too. Yes. <laughs> Okay, we need short answers. William, are these new players or the same old players? These are absolutely new players. I think a good example of that is, is a guy who travels around with us. He came out of his world, Mike Holler. He writes a book, um, Constitution Made Easy. Hey, Mike. And, and so that's one of the things that I'm finding. People who love their country are finding their groove and taking their groove and getting busy for America. Everyone has a groove. You have to find it. And once you identify it, you can get hooked up. And I find that people that I'm meeting are like, what do I do? What do I do? And this is enthusiasm that comes from, from love of country. So yes, there are a lot of new people. Michelle, recycling the activists or really expanding the circle? We've got new believers and people that have been doing this for over 25 years. John, uh, yeah. you got that firsthand exposure as you campaigned. How did you read California? Yeah, and I'll, and I'll compare it to 25 years ago when I managed the statewide race. Um, you know, the people that were involved then were still involved in the Tea Party movement, but instead of five people, it was 500. Uh, 85, 90 percent of the people in the movement were new. So we're getting a real multiplier effect. Exactly. Now, as we have that multiplier effect, come back down the other way, starting with, with Professor Eastman. Just a quick, quick take. Is the Tea Party vote effect in the fall more likely to elect what Bachman calls constitutional conservatives, Republicans who aren't rhinos, or is there a concern of any of you that that will wedge away to third party or independent candidates and perhaps have the unforeseen effect of, of electing liberals and Democrats. John? And that depends in part on what the Republicans do. If they nominate conservative, principled conservatives, the Tea Party will be with them. If they don't, they won't. We, we've seen it at the presidential level in recent times work for both parties. No Ralph Nader, no President Bill Clinton. But then, on the other hand, uh, I'm sorry, no Ross Perot, no President Bill Clinton. But then in 2000, no Ralph Nader, no President George W. Bush. So, Michelle, which do you think it's going to be? Is there, is there the danger that the wrong people get elected because of a wedge effect? I don't know what the answer is, but uh, that's why I brought my football. <laughs> if you give me a minute, I can explain I've been that. dying to know about the football. <laughs> we all have. Well, uh, I compare this movement and this year to a football game. The left has been playing football very well. They've been scoring and scoring and scoring. The right has been doing who knows what trying to figure out what principle is, trying to figure out who's the head, trying to figure out which way is right. And in Colorado, there are two extremes. And the reason I have a football is I go around and I talk about the big vision, the big picture. This, when the Founding Fathers wrote the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, it was not about candidates. It was about how they understood the nature of human beings. They understood men will fail and they developed the Constitution based on that. Obviously, candidates are important. Obviously, we have to get strong conservative candidates elected. But we just got into this game in 2009. And the symptoms have been there since, in my lifetime, strongly since 2000 with George W. Bush's hanging Chaz election. And, you know, it, was, it took 2008 for us to realize, oh my goodness, we really have to do something here. And there are a lot of excited, passionate people in the movement. And there are, there's definitely um, what I would call a chasm between what people who call the, themselves grassroots and establishment. And it's pretty evident here in Colorado. And if, if you're not involved with the activism, you probably are oblivious to it. 
but um, there are extremes, and I, like I said, in the middle, we have that silent majority, the silent foot soldiers who are doing so much work, and we have leaders on both sides of the grassroots establishment who um, don't trust each other. And um, I take this football with me to remind people that this year it's the Super Bowl, and whoever wins the Super Bowl determines the outcome for freedom. Yeah. Freedom was here, now she's here. If we want her to fall here, we can just get ourselves all caught up in the nitpicky issues and right. lose it. And I have heard people talk about a third party. They, there are some out there who want that. Um, there are some who won't vote if their candidate doesn't win in the August primary. And there are candidates who mudsling at each other and nobody likes it. And the, uh, Ronald Reagan's 11th commandment was something like, don't trash each other. And <laughs> That's a tweeter version. <laughs> <laughs> don't trash each other. We've got to keep our eyes on the ball, folks, and I, it's huge. Our, our faith, our, our actions require faith, and our faith requires action. And we have got to focus on the big picture. God created this nation out of, against all odds, humanly speaking, and this Freedom Revival is going to win against all odds based on our faith as well. We have got to stay focused on freedom and the prize. Preach it, sister. Amen. All right. We're watching the clock, we're going to cut to just a couple questions from any of you oh. for the panelists. Oh. Yeah, I wanted that football. You got to el hurting. elbow her. She took your time, man. My brother's hurting. <laughs> well, maybe you've stunned them all into silence. Yeah, back there. Okay, they're not saying nothing, so. <laughs> this is on. Uh, my question is, is a lot of what's happening in these movements is a little bit more global, talking about the big issues and principles, but we need the local action. It's nice to think globally, we gotta act locally, we gotta get candidates elected. How do we get all these different groups working to get candidates elected? All right, Owens, it's your turn since you got cut off a minute ago, and, and this gives you a chance to maybe answer the uh, slur that says you guys are some sort of a front, some sort of astroturf or Dick Army's puppet or something like that. How does it translate to local? Thanks for the setup. <laughs> <laughs> um, last week on my blog, I wrote an article that I believe answers that question. Bill O'Reilly made a statement on Fox News that I don't agree with. He said that 90% of black America is in the can. Just recently, I went out on the streets with my camera and I went into a barber shop and I started doing interviews. And I also went on the streets of Silver Spring, Maryland, downtown, and I spoke with all black Americans, and I asked them some specific questions. And the, the, the polls came back, which were astronomical. Over 90% of the people would vote for a candidate, regardless of their party, if they best represented their principles. And then we had, then we had 100% um, of them participated in signing a pledge to their principles over party. Then we had, 85% um, that would vote to repeal the death tax, of which 13% of black American wealth is extracted from it because of that death tax. The Chicago Tribune almost closed their doors because of that. So what I'm saying to you is this. Um, no, black America is not in the can. The key is communication. The, the key is taking the football and playing it with every community, with every section of our community, and sticking with the issue, sticking with those issues that's relevant to them. And so I believe, like never before, we have an opportunity to, to attract principle-centered black Americans, I know we're all Americans, okay, but principle uh, black Americans to vote their principles. Let them stay in their party, but vote their principles. While 90% of black Americans presumably voted for Obama, it was over 76% that kept marriage defined between a man and woman in California. Now go figure that out. So what I'm telling you is, it is not a slam dunk from the Democrats. We have an opportunity like never before to stick with the issues and simply be real. And people can feel you that. Don't look this, just look people in the eye and just speak the truth. I feel better. William, uh, William thank you. And uh, it, is, it is with the football that, that we will close. Before we thank the panel, I just have to observe Unfortunately, the camera doesn't lie. We know from the last couple of baseball opening days in April that we got a president who throws like a girl. I mean, what can you say? <laughs> I haven't seen 
Michelle Moore and limber up her arm, but something tells me she, that she throws a bullet spiral like Brett Favre. <laughs> we thank Michelle Moran, William Owens, Charles Patrickoff, and our panel chairman, John Eastman. And, and John, on behalf of the Tea Party Express, we'd like to present to you the Tea Party Express Commemorative Journal. We do have a few here. Thank you so much. Thank you, my friend. We'll ask uh, 